you would stand and turn with me your Bibles to Isaiah 55. Isaiah chapter 55. You know, verse 1. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And you labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me and eat you that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Even the sure mercies of David. Everybody say everlasting covenant. Everybody say the mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people. Who? David. A leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him, brother and sister, this morning while he is near. Let not the wicked forsake his let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as high as for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Lord Jesus, you have already begun a work. We want you to finish it. We want you, when this is all said and done, to have done everything that you wished to do. Upon every mind and every heart and every soul in this place. The saving knowledge of you be here. The understanding about deliverance and blessing be here. Healing. You are everything we need. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Let's lift him up one more time before we sit down and praise him again. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Ryan. I want you to get a, a, come up here, get a microphone, and I want you to find Zechariah in the complete Jewish Bible is what I need. You guys have that up there too, so when it comes to it, you can put it up there. Dar Robinson, what a name, Dar, as a first, I thought my name was difficult, D-A-R. Dar Robinson is considered by most who know anything about it at all or care to be the greatest stuntman in movie history. That's why you don't know his name, because he's a stuntman, and they're all about not giving you their name. They're supposed to be somebody else, you know, but they're the ones that do the impossible things. James Bond jumping off of a car into a plane that's already going down, which is totally impossible. But what you did see was an individual going through the air towards a plane. That's the stuntman. The stuntman is the guy that's running through the explosions, and then they show you a close-up of the hero's face, but that's not really him. He's just an actor that lies. The stuntman is the one running through everything. They get injured. Actors do not, unless they try to do the ropes, right? <laughs> Dar Robinson, considered to be the greatest, never broke a bone in his entire career. Somehow he was durable, he was safe, he was whatever was needed to be in order to accomplish this. But one day, doing a 
He'd already done his impressive stunt for the movie. He has set up to do a much lesser stunt. It's a little driving exercise. I don't know how many times he's driven, but good grief. They do it in every movie. Everybody's got a car chase. He's going through the motions of doing it. It was so unimportant that the ambulance left. The medical team left. He was just going through. But he wasn't. The car didn't know. The medical team didn't know. Nobody else knew. That was his last day. In doing his little stunt in the car, he lost control and went head first off a cliff with the car. Not a broken bone in his body in all those years. And he died doing a mediocre stunt. I bet everybody in this house this morning could tell me stories about people who have passed away, who have went on, who have had things, enormous things happen in their lives that you know personally. But they didn't know it was their last day. There was no clue it was their last day. They weren't sick. They weren't uh, even close to it. I was reading about another one, an, an actress that uh, had got famous a while ago, but she wasn't very old. She was really just a little bit older than me. I know some of the young people think that's old, but whatever. And I looked her up, and she, she died uh, last year. She didn't die of, die of a virus. She died from uh, an intestinal blockage that turned into an infection that turned into this, that turned into that, that turned into, and next thing you know, she's gone. I'm not trying to scare anybody this morning, but if you don't already know that any time could be your last moment on earth, then you just haven't gotten old enough yet. Only you young ones are invincible. The rest of us know we're not. We've already proved it to ourselves. Zechariah chapter 1, and beginning with, ver we're going to read verses 1 through 6, brother. But You're going to have it up here in the Complete Jewish Bible, are you? All right. Zechariah chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Let's read it. In the eighth month of the second year of Dereshiv, the following message from Adonai came to Zechariah, the son of Bereshia, the son of Edo, the prophet. Adonai was extremely angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell them that Adonai, Tezavototh, says this, return to me, says Adonai, and I will return to you, says Adonai. You're cheating. <laughs> Say, say, Savat. Savat. Okay. Adonai Savat. There you go. Don't be like your ancestors, the earlier prophets proclaimed to them. Adonai Savat says to turn back now from your evil ways and deeds. But they didn't listen or pay attention to me, huh. says Adonai. Your ancestors, where are they? Your ancestors, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my laws, which I ordered my servants to, the prophets, which I ordered my servants, the prophets, overlook your ancestors, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Then they turned and said, Adonai has dealt with us accordingly to our ways and deeds, just as he intended to do. Did, On, did the bad guys last? Did the prophets last? He makes a point of this when he says, my word and my laws lasted. What God does is eternal. Part, a large part, of the problem that we have, the way God does things, is that He's eternal. Not eternal only in the soul, because He's created us as souls to be eternal, but He is eternal completely. God has always been he always will be. And as such, as the only one who is such, he has a view that's different. If you are, you don't even have to be at war. If you're playing airsoft, if you're doing anything like that, you wish to have the high ground. You want to be in a position where you can see more than your adversary can see. Well, God has a reserved position. That is his alone. 
where he can always see better than his adversary. He sees better than anybody else does. Sister Jester sings the song, and I believe sometimes I've helped her with it. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Love that song. But really, he's an out-of-time God. Yes, he is. He's not in time. Now, stretch your minds a little bit. I get it, but try to do it. Not only is his position higher than everybody else's is, not only is he eternal, always existing when there was nothing he was there, but he exists in all time. When he looks at things, he does not look at them as the past, the present, and the future, which is a major inhibitor for you and I, because that's the only way we see everything. What used to be, what is, and what's to come. To God, they are all the same. Because he, as God, is not in time. He is not in anything. He is God. We got timing and music. Saw a little bit of that this morning. Sister Maria threw, threw that at the musicians and didn't they show up? They just came right through and I thank God for that. And Brother Wyatt will tell you, I'm not the greatest drummer in the world, but he did just fine. Timing is necessary. A song out of timing. Oh, nobody wants to listen to that. You can have a bad taste in music. You still wouldn't like that. You at least want the beat to be right. God has perfect timing. Because nothing affects it. You hear me? All of us have things get in the way. It messes up the goals that we are trying to achieve. God has no such thing. He does what he wants to do, and he does it when he wants to do it. Every single time. His ways are above our ways, the verse read. Oh, and, uh, and Isaiah, we love that. His ways, his ways are above our ways. Because we need to read the whole thing like we did at the beginning here. His ways are above your ways even when you disagree with him. His ways are above your ways even when you can't see it. And most of the time, if you're honest, most of the time you don't see it. You don't see what God is doing most of the time. The primary weakness of atheistic arguments is this. It's the view that they're coming from. They try to present a view whereby they, the created, can explain their creator away. It is an impossibility because they're not coming from a position where they can do it. It is I can't even give you an analogy as to what that's like. I can't. I couldn't say that would be like uh, an infant, okay, trying to come up here and preach for me. Or, let's get worse, pastor a church, an infant. No, it's not like that. It's way, way worse than that. You understand? It is more likely that an infant can pastor a church than that an atheist can understand the, uh, the omnipotent mind of God. It is not within, listen, it is not within my ability to understand all that God understands. To know all that God knows. I know some people think they can, but that's just more wrong. It messes everything up when I don't understand that there is an eternal view going on that I, without his help, cannot comprehend. We want extraordinary power. And we want it in ordinary times. Bear with me. The miracle of the Bible the miracles in the Bible occurred at extraordinary times. The miracles of the Bible occurred when it was necessary. You understand? There had to be a necessity for the miracle before there was a miracle. We want extraordinary power all the time. We want God to move in everything for us. 
just like we think he should. We want his answers to be our answers. We want him to, Lord Jesus, I got two jobs, and I want a better job. So I want you to give me a better job. I don't care what that might entail, but just give me the better job. And God's going, if I give you the better job, it's going to mess you up. I don't want to do that. I know what to do. Trust me. And that is the point you get to where you make a choice. You either say, all right, you're God and you know, or you insist on your way. You say, God, I understand that you know all things, but I at least know this. That's what we do. Yes, God, I understand you know everything, but I know this much. I understand this much. Oh, when we don't understand it, it is easy to trust him. It is difficult to trust him when we understand what we think we understand. And he says no. We want extraordinary power in ordinary times. However, miracles come in necessity. Frankly, we don't know which is which beforehand anyway, most of the time. We don't know when it's going to be an emergency until it's already an emergency. Can't tell you how many times when I used to work on the ambulance that that would happen. We'd be going to somewhere, I got a tummy ache, turns into a gunshot wound. Where's the gun? Where's the guy that shot you? Where's the, you know, oh, lots of emergencies come up then when you show up. This is what we do. We get partial information and think we know everything. Then we show up to the thing knowing all our stuff and we didn't know anything. There's only one solution for this. There's only one thing that works. It worked on the ambulance. It'll work in every other situation. Do you know what it is? Do your job in ordinary times. Bear with me. You cannot expect God to miraculously move in all the mistakes that you're making, which you shouldn't have made because you weren't doing your job on your ordinary days. Somebody say amen. I want God to heal this cancer. I want him to deliver this drug addict. I want him to, and God's going, I can do anything. How about you pray today? How about you read your word today? What is so difficult about reading the letter I sent you to help you live better? What's so difficult about opening your mouth for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 of your 24-hour day and talking to me like I'm real? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with you worshiping me as God who has already done all the things that I have done? How difficult? Why is that difficult? But then I won't pray two days. I won't read the Bible unless I'm sitting in church. And I don't worship unless I'm sitting in church. And then the disaster comes and I'm crying out to God for a miracle that I wouldn't be so worked up about if I'd been doing my job. When you show up there at that emergency in your ambulance when you show up there, the training's already been done. There's no time to stop the emergency to train you properly. You're either trained or you're not. First time I came across a scene of emergency, and I got out of the, it was my first time. It was my, you know what a first time is, right? That's the first time, it means you don't know. All you have is what you're taught, that's it. And it amazed me, it took about five seconds for the training to kick in. I remembered everything. I was remembering stuff that had nothing to do with the emergency. Remembering everything. And the guy that was with me, he did know. It was nowhere near his first time. And he was getting out of the truck. And he was doing most of the, of the stuff to, with, the, with the patient because he has more knowledge than me. And I'm going, talking to the crowd. Everybody get back. Give them room. Does anybody know who this is? Where, what, what happened? I'm trying to get, gather information. The training was just there. But the training would not have been there if I hadn't trained. That's not going to happen. 
What's the problem then? It's pretty easy. The problem is, I don't think I need training. I get the Holy Ghost, I'm baptized in Jesus. And let me just stop right here. If you've not repented of your sins, if you've not been baptized in his name and the blood washed over you, and you've not been filled with the Spirit, you've got all kinds of stuff to do first. You need that, okay? But I'm preaching this morning to all of you that's already had all of this in your life. Okay? You can't just go, well, I got the Holy Ghost, and I've got his blood on me, and I've repented my sins, at least, you know, I did a couple weeks ago, and I'm, I'm ready for everything. I don't got to study nothing. When that preacher preaches, I just sit back and laugh at his gaffes and pick up one or two little nuggets that I can carry around. That's what I get for this week. I pick and choose the message. After a while, you don't care about the message anymore. After a while, you've already proved it. See, you've proved it to yourself in your limited viewpoint that your prayer life doesn't matter and your worship doesn't matter and reading the Word certainly doesn't matter because when I read the Word, He corrects me all the time and I don't understand why He's doing that when I read the Word. I just want to get a little blessing out of it. I just want to read Psalms and, and I want to hear about how wonderful God is and I keep running across the wrong Psalms. You know what I'm talking about. The Psalms that say, I am worthless, I am a worm, I am down here in the dirt, and, I, and I'm an awful human being, and I need God. That, those ones. I don't want those ones. Where's the ones about, you know, how about Psalm 23? We sung it today. How about that? Can we just have that Psalm? Can I just have the one that, that has all of the flow and the, the smooth water and the green grass and the... the, the, the Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. It means you've got to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You ain't reading right. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Not that the evil ain't going to show up, but that you're there. And if he's there, he's making a point of it, the evil's probably showing up. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know what a rod and a staff are? Do you? That's not That's not pleasant. Oh, Lord, break my leg if I wander again. Nobody's ever prayed it, ever. Because, Lord, I love it when you bandage it up and you carry me around and you love on me. Nobody wants the broke leg to get there. You say so, you're a liar. You're a liar. Nobody wants to hear about getting whacked around. He's got to reach down with that crook and pull me up. Because once again, I've went to the same exact cliff. And once again, I'm halfway falling off. When the shepherd shows up, I'm just some sheep. <laughs> Help me. Hell, I don't know how I got here. You weren't listening to the shepherds how you got there. And then he picks you up and he takes you back and he puts you with the flock. He does what? He puts you with the flock. He Put you with the flock. You don't serve God on your own. I am holy enough. No, you're not. I am righteous enough. Not even close. Your righteousness is the same as mine. Filthy rags. That's no kind of clothes to wear. You wouldn't, well, some people I have seen show up at Walmart with dirty, with filthy rags. But I'm saying, most people put proper clothes on before they go out in public. Just saying. We can no longer rule anything out. <laughs> no soldier is in charge of his own training. Not in any country, not in any army on the planet ever was the soldier in charge of the training. Why? Because the soldier's going to do what he, no matter how cool he is, he's going to do with what he feels he can handle. Even if he's trying to get tougher, he's going to get tougher than what he feels he can handle. And there are those who know you can handle more. They are interested in taking everyone together, not individually, and working them to the bone. Way, way past the point that the individual thought they could do it, the group achieves. Why? Because the soldier isn't in charge of his training. Somebody higher up is. Somebody who knows more than he knows is in charge. The ordinary is preparation for the extraordinary. 
The same voice speaks in both. The same God moves in both. You have to beat the lion and you have to beat the bear before you get to face the giant. You cannot be all glory and no guts. You got to, you got to be willing for the guts and the glory. Before I can defeat that giant and hear my name shouted that I won 10,000 battles that I didn't win. That's what he was, they started talking about David. Saul has won his thousands and David is 10,000. He beat one giant. He did not, he did not win 10,000 fights. It's no wonder Saul got upset over it. Anybody would have got upset over it. Saul's literally led battles. David killed one giant. Yeah, the giant was scaring Saul and it didn't scare David and that's a cool thing and it's a, as we already know, a bad, maybe the greatest story ever, a fantastic story whose depths is impossible to plummet, uh, plumb all of it out. It really is, but it's not 10,000 fights. But before you can get that in your life, you got to keep the sheep. You got to sing songs to God that only God gets to hear. You got to be treated like the runt and the last, so much so that when it comes time to crown a king, your own father doesn't think about calling you in. Mm. David, just out there, strumming his heart, singing his songs. His great songs. The sheep don't can't tell great songs from bad ones. My dogs can't tell great songs from bad ones. They do like bass, though. They like the beat. But that's about it as far as their understanding of it goes. David's playing to God only. And a bunch of sheep some, that somebody else's sheep that he's taking care of. Listen to me, but you have to take care of your father's sheep before you can take care of your father's sheep. David was in training, whether he even knew it or not. Even after the anointing oil is dripped on David's head, he still has to wait. It takes the giant stepping out. It takes an emergency for a very well-trained young man to see his purpose in that moment. If he hadn't prepped himself before, it would have made no difference. He never would have achieved it. Lord Jesus, why, when I read in your word so many different miracles, why is it that no li I've never moved a literal mountain? I've never said to a mountain, move, be cast into the sea, and the mountain be moved and cast into the sea. Never even heard of somebody doing it. Why is it that I've not ripped any lions? Well, I do have one thing for that, and that is I've never put myself in a position to have to rip a lion. I'm not jumping over any cages into any zoos just to see if it works. As you come bounding towards me, Lord, I hope you know what you're doing. Only to hear from God, I didn't do that. You did that. Have at it, son. Why have I ever seen any sun stop? The greatest miracle for me in the scripture is not even the raising of the dead. It's Joshua in the middle of a fight looking up at the sun and saying, stand still. And it does it. The entire universe listens to one dude because he's tired. I get so weary in my fight, Brother Star. You know, it's the same old thing time after time, over and over. Don't lose out with God because you're weary. If you're weary, you will reap in due season if you faint not. It didn't say if you, you can stop fighting. Nope, it says don't faint. That's a lot of difference. Ask Brother Wyatt. Fainting. Yeah. See a splatter. Oh, no, I don't think that's no. You just, we got one in our car right now. We can't kill it. 
The jumping spider, I've tried, Gabe's tried. We're pretty sure he's still there. Sister Maria is so sure he's there, she's riding in the back seat. She's not riding up there because she's come face to face with him twice, and that's all. Her great big strong husband took his shoe off and bashed that thing, and he fell down somewhere, and I was like, no, nope, that second time I got him. Maybe I didn't. Maybe it's a Samson spider. I don't know what, what's going on with him, but he just keeps popping back up. <laughs> hey, and it's a jumping spider, people. It's a jumping spider. Some, can we all agree that that ought to be illegal? Okay? He goes, boing, and he's somewhere else entirely. You're too small for that. What is the purpose of being a jumping spider anyway? That's the purpose. Why haven't I seen furnaces nullified? When was the last time you were asked to get in a furnace? When was the last time you were broke? Not Brother Scare Scout. He's seen lots of, I'm saying, you know, not, not that way. I'm talking about in them, in them, not touching them. Thrown into the furnace. Did that, did that happen to anybody last week? Have you had a mountain get in your way that if you don't move it out of the way, God's will can't be done? No. Please understand, that's why you haven't seen that happen, because it's not necessary. But there's going to come a time in your life where that mountain's going to have to go. That furnace has to die down. And I'm going to tell you this, and I want you to hear me just as clear. Even with all your training, even with all your readiness, it's not going to be you that does it. In that moment, the God of eternity that's been seeing it all happen at the same time is going to be the one who's going to do it. The three Hebrew children, which is a terrible title for them because they weren't. They were grown men. The three Hebrew children did not stop the furnace. The furnace was still hot when they got thrown in. But there was a God already in the fire. I have no idea when he got there. The Bible says nothing about when God showed up in the fire. Just that he was there. They get thrown in. Hello, boys. Right on my time. <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar had no idea that this is going to result in him coming to know a God that was foreign to him. But when this is over, and a couple more lessons are learned from Nebuchadnezzar, he becomes the only the only conquering king of Israel, I mean that conquered Israel, not an Israelite, to write in the word of God. He got to write a chapter in the book. Doing the ordinary daily. Do it daily so you are practiced and ready for the miraculous. Isaiah 55 and 10. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto what? What's that? I sent it. Ah, all of the concepts of this God that lives up in space somewhere and doesn't care about you or I and doesn't care about what goes on is dispensed with this one phrase because he purposed it. He is intent here. This is purposeful. I sent it. That's it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. And the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Last one. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name. What? The myrtle tree. It 
it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that what? Well, if it's an everlasting sign, it can't be cut off, can it? It's an everlasting sign that can it shall not be cut off. Have you ever drove out on this highway? If you've drove any length of time, you know where the police tend to like to be, don't you? Come on, in your area. You don't know outside of it, but in your area. I can tell you, okay, from Exmoor at least to Salisbury at least, where they're going to be. Because they're almost always there. Now, once in a while, them little buggers will surprise you. It's their job after all. So obey the speed limit and you won't have to worry about it. But you do know where they are, right? But it's not an everlasting sign. Something can come up and they got to move. They take up a new position, right? So, speed limit signs change. That can mess you up. You're used to going faster in an area and all of a sudden they change it. No, you might get caught. In uh, a couple of TV shows I've seen, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure it's in um, Mayberry, Andy Griffith show, uh, they have a, have a speed trap and the sheriff d don't like it. doesn't like having something that tricks people. He wants them to obey the law and not get tricked into getting caught not obeying the law. I like that. That's a, that's a better idea. This is an this myrtle tree that has disappeared from off of this screen, but is still what I'm preaching, there it is, is an everlasting sign. Does everybody get it? I've said enough about it? Okay, good. Moving on. The myrtle tree grows in temperate zones. Did you know that we live in a temperate zone? That is the worst name I've ever heard for where we are. I get what they're trying to say. It's not always snowy, and it's not always burning up, so it's temperate. But temperate is the last thing this is. Hence, snowflakes in April. What in the world? I love snow. Not in April. I'm not. It's the wrong time, okay? Just like you bums that love it when the Indian summer comes back around. It's not supposed to be there. Stop it. In September! No, September, bad burning, go away. Leave fat boy alone. I want to be cool. It's hard to be cool. <laughs> Myrtle trees grow in temperate zones. They grow in zones where there can be different environments happening throughout their season. So they're in a zone of seasons. Got it? No way we're getting through all this. They they are always by water. A myrtle tree cannot grow if there is not a steady supply of water available. They can grow big and they can remain small. Depends on the variety of myrtle as to how big they get. A lot of us around here, we know what a crepe myrtle is. Don't really see or grow huge. But there are myrtle trees that do. In the scripture, they are used as a sign of God's blessing, abundance. Hence you find them here instead of the briar. Something that's grown after the garden, after spring, after the fall. If it was there before it wasn't affecting Adam, who did not tear his skin, which is what my personal opinion was. But either way, it didn't become a problem until afterwards, because God said it. He said, it's going to uh, to grow up and you'll discomfort you. After the fall. So this thing here, after the fall, instead of that, instead of that, instead of that sign of the fall, you get the myrtle. You get the blessing a sign of the blessing and of the abundance of God. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to go there. I know you're going to put it up, and I love you for it, but sometimes I don't want to just read it off the screen. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. 
Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man laying from his mother's womb, he'd been laying from it his whole life, was carried. Some of y'all are laying like that. You're laying. Anyway, when they, laid, when they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. He had a regular job. That's what he did. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. This is another ordinary day for this guy. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. Why do you got to make it weird? And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Oh, they're going to give me big money. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. His heart just dropped. <laughs> silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Notice how he did it. In the name of Jesus, the power comes. But then Peter reaches out his hand, grabs the guy's hand, and pulls him to his feet, leaving no other option. But you're either going to fall on your face or you're walking. Oh, we read, we read ourselves into it till we get there. We read, oh, silver and gold have I none. That's me, hallelujah. I got nothing. That's an apostolic. <laughs> For what I have, give I thee. How oh, I'm calling on the name of Jesus. I believe him. I believe for answers. When was the last time you took somebody by the hand and lifted them up? There was a brother. We were at camp. He was just coming. He's passed away now. Wonderful guy. He would sit right here in his wheelchair. And he would type in stuff. It took a long time for him to type in words. And then the computer would say the words. I, I wish all of you had known him. He would worship. He would embarrass you. Even if you jump up and down, he'd embarrass you. Because he couldn't even get out of the seat. But he would do this with his hands. And he would do it with his feet. And he would do it and do it and do it. And his grin on his face. We're at, now he's been in church for a little while. We prayed for him. You know we have. We're in the sanctuary. Camp is going on. Service has exploded. You know. You know how it works. The Lord is moving and I'm praying for people and I'm believing. Until God says, go and pray for him that I will heal him. What if he doesn't get healed? And then I remember something my father told me when he was praying for somebody in Milford, Delaware, to get up and walk. And, and he said he had the same feeling. And God told him, he says, what's it to you? You're not going to get the glory for it if he's healed. You're not going to get the blame for it if he's not. It's not about you. Okay, God. Once again, with the arguments I can't argue with, so off I go, and I'm praying for him, and this scripture comes to mind. And I begin to believe and feel the Lord wants me to take this, move this thing out of the way, take him and pick him up, and walk with him. Lord, he wasn't a little guy. What if I drop him? And then some of you little skinny people, I've been like, whoop, I walk over Brother Kevon, just throw over my shoulder, he's running around there. Just kidding. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Pretty sure he still has more muscles than me. What, what would I have to do what God tells me to do, regardless of anything else? So here my silly self goes over there, and I move the thing out of the way, and I got another brother, and he, he's believing. He's believing. He sees what's happening, and he starts getting excited. We, we lay hands on him and we pray for him, and he's responding. I, he's not not responding. He's believing. He wants it to, and it's oh my goodness. And then then this the moment. Do I walk away? He don't know what God said to me. Do I walk away, or do I do what God's told me to do? I reached down and I put my arms around him and said, "We're going to stand up now, brother, and God's going to heal you, and you're going to walk." And I picked him up out of the seat. And I felt his legs strengthen. 
By that I mean I felt the weight of him come off of me. He supported himself. He could not support himself. You need to understand he wasn't going around walking if you assisted him. That's not how this was. It was way, way past that. And I'm going, oh my goodness. I moved my hands off to his shoulder. I'm still, you know, maybe this is a mistake. And he takes a step. Oh, this shaky little step. He didn't jump up and run around the room. And I'm with you there. And then he took another one. Go back further. So I'm holding hands to hands. And he's walking. He's walking. The place is going absolutely bananas. Of course, that's what's going to happen. And we're walking around. And I don't know what's next. I didn't know what to do. Do I let go of him completely? I got to warn him first. I don't want him falling down. This guy falls down, then that's going to be, that's not about the way I look. That's about him getting injured. I, I don't want to do that. And I felt in that moment him lose a little bit of what he was believing in. In his arms, he gets his arms moved back to his arm. I felt two hold him. And I walked, I circled him back. The brother brought his seat up. And I sat him back down in the seat. He never did walk again. Oh, I know. You thought this was going to end a different way, didn't you? Which one of us wasn't believing? I have no option but to believe it started with me. In that moment, when I didn't understand what to do next, I should have thrown caution to the wind and left it to God. There are some who will disagree with me. I mean it. They will disagree. No, you can't do that. What if he falls? What if he falls was what became on my mind. And that's not what was supposed to be on my mind. What was supposed to be on my mind was get ready for what's getting ready to happen now. I'm telling you, this has bothered me without me saying a word to any person ever for years. It was a moment that blessed him. He thanked me profusely for praying for him. He was very happy that he got to walk around. He was. But nothing else happened. When we look at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we look at it and we say, why this particular time? Hopefully you've done that at some point. Isn't it important? Yes, it's important. It would have been important when Jesus was born and and died and rose from the grave. It would have been an important time frame. And once you realize that, you easily realize it had to be then. This was the moment where the Roman Empire had gotten the majority of the world all on the same track. Even their adversaries, they were communicating. There were roads being built that had not happened before. There was this, uh, the ability for the word to get out. Do you understand? Quickly. This is why Jesus is going from town to town and, and the news of him is spreading before he gets there. It's the perfect opportunity. We don't have the the printing press yet, no. But we do have people writing stuff now. I'm talking about at the regular pace. They wrote it down. It's not a coincidence that this ability to write and spread it throughout the whole wide world became available in the time when Jesus walked the earth. You see... God's timing is immaculate. It's immaculate. That means absolutely wholly perfect. Psalm 127 and verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. We do our job, but if God ain't in it, it's not going to get done. Next one. Next verse. It is vain for you to rise up early and vain to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, 
For so he giveth what? His beloved sleep. All you late nighters, you night owls, it's not wrong for you to be a night owl, but it is wrong if what you're doing is eating bread of sorrow. Hallelujah. Let me say it. Your depression is coming because of the cycle you've put yourself in. Oh my. Get mad with me, it's okay. As long as you break the habit. Listen, learn how to go to bed. Learn how to get sleep. Do what you have to do to prep you for going to sleep. And stop eating, thinking on all the sorrows in your life. The scripture says, what do you change by your worry? You can't add an a inch to your height. You can't make anything happen. gives you his sleep. I've prayed this prayer before when I couldn't go to sleep and had already done everything else. Because I take it a lot of times when I can't sleep that God wants me to pray. So I'll pray and I'll pray for whatever is, is coming up. It usually has to do with somebody I'm talking to right now. You know, That's usually how it pans out. And I'm praying and I'm praying and, and the devil don't like that. He'll want you to go back to sleep. So I mean, he'll, he'll stop messing with you. But if, you know, if, if it's him. But a lot of times it's God that's fine. That's not this. It's not bread of sorrow. But he said, he, he give us his life. I'll say, Lord, you said you give me your beloved sleep. I'm beloving it right now. Give me the sleep. So I, and I can go to sleep. There's no time. Second Corinthians 12. 1. I have no time. I want the musicians to come up here and get ready. 2 Corinthians 12, 1, verse 1, and then 6 through 10. Paul is writing and he's talking about coming into Revelations and how it's not a prideful thing to say it. He says, doubtless, there's no doubt that I'm going to come into it. And that the glory is going to be there. And I don't want you to think that the glory is about me. The glory, he says, is about God. That's who gets the glory. He's the one who's causing all of it to happen. You can get these scripture verses from me later if you need them. Philippians 4, 18 and 19 talks about, yeah, put that one up there. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Ephroditus. <laughs> Where did Brother Ryan go? I uh, didn't get you that one, huh? With the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Next verse. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Here is a phenomenal understanding, and it is this. There is a continual supply of everlasting riches that are designated for the needs that I have when I need it. Not before. Lord, give me the strength. Give me the power. Give me everything before you have need of it. No. But when your need arises, there is an absolute law in place here. You're going to have what you need to cover it. You're going to have what you need when you need it. God supplies it, and he supplies it continually. Then I'm, then I'm reminded, why so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your trust in yourself. No. In the church. No. Put your trust in God. In Zechariah chapter 1, verses 7 through 21. And you can write this down because we're not going to get to it. Zechariah chapter 2, 1 through 13. Not going to get it. We're not ever going to get there. Zechariah 1, 7. <coughs> Upon the 4 and 20th day of the 11th month, which is the month Sabbat, in the year of, Z of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Barakah, Barak, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, it's the same exact intro that you heard, brother. Ryan Reed earlier. It's another prophecy. I saw, by, he says, I saw by night and behold a man riding upon a red horse. Proper translation would be a russet horse. Russet is more orange and brown. 
He stood among the myrtle trees. He stood where? Brother and sister, do you can you read this? Is it is that in English? Yeah. It's in English, huh? He he stood among the what trees? You remember the myrtle trees? I, I just talked about them 15 minutes ago. He stood among the myrtle trees right at the bottom, and behind him were their red horses speckled and white. Then said I, oh, my Lord, what are these? That sounds like something I would say. Oh, my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me, he said unto me, I will show you what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. He's got a group of angels whose job it is to walk the earth to and fro. Remember the devil said he was doing that in Job? You think that's interesting? He was trying to do somebody else's job. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro from the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long? O Lord of hosts, how long? Will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast an indignation these three score and ten years? How long is your anger going to be against your people, God? The Lord answered the angel. The angels are having a conversation with God. You follow it? And Zechariah gets to be privy to it. This is mind-blowing stuff. The Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. I don't know how Zechariah knew it. Maybe it was the tone of God's voice because he has to get a translation from the angel. But he knows that they are, in his words, good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased with my people. That's what he's saying. I was a little displeased with them. And they helped forward the affliction. These other nations, they went too far with my people. Thus say, therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in them, saith the Lord of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Anybody know what the line is? I got the scriptures that I didn't read. You can look them up. The plummet line. Jesus, the Messiah. The line by which everything else is measured. He's saying he's got it right now. He's measuring it up. He talks about horns. He talks about carpenters. He goes all through all this stuff. He gets to the end. Then you go into chapter 2, and he just keeps going. You know what russet is? The color, how you get russet if you try to make it? You mix orange. I mean, you mix, it's more of an orange. You mix to get orange, you mix red and yellow. Most of you know that because you've got crayons. I know you've done it at least one or two times. Red and yellow make orange. Red in the scripture typifies the flesh. Yellow in the scripture typifies trials. Trials and flesh mixed together to make the one color. And the other color that makes the russet work might be a surprise is purple. These combined make the russet color horses in this vision. You know, the horses that are underneath the, the trees of God's blessing and abundance. His blessing and his abundance are found in the same place testing and trial of your flesh combined with the purple majesty of God are found. Would you stand with me? See, Lord, I want to be used of you. And God says, fantastic. I got, a, I got this perfect plan. We're like 
Yes, a plan is good because I don't have one. That's good. What's the plan, God? Tell me the plan. God says, first, I'm going to take you. Yeah. I'm going to beat you. What? This is a plan for my blessing, God. And God says, yes, absolutely, absolutely. First, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you so hard, and I'm going to beat you so long that you're going to wish that the beating would stop long, long before I actually stop doing it. I'm going to beat you. What are you doing? I'm making you a weapon. When I get done beating you, I'm going to heat you way up hotter than you're ever going to want to be heated. I'm going to put you through the fire. Then what are you going to do? This ain't sounding good. Then I'm going to plunge you in the water. <laughs> and I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it until I have the weapon that my vision wishes to have, not yours. God, I have this great big plan for my life. Your life is mine. I made you and have purpose. You've already agreed to all this. Now let me forge you in the fire. Let me make out of you what you should be. Would you bow your head today and nobody looking at anybody else? This altar is open. I mean it. You can kneel by your chair if you wish to do it that way. That's perfectly fine. But right now, would you please make an altar? Because the response to this message is not a hand clap. It's not a thank you, Jesus. The response to this message, the only proper response is finding an altar. And saying, God, your view is better than mine. You know more of what you're doing than I do. Do what you desire to do. Go ahead and say, the altars are open right now. What will you do with this Jesus? If the altar's where you meet us, sing it. Take me there. Take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here. My life is here. And I'll be a living sacrifice for you. Through the fire, the refiner. I want to be concerned. I want to be tried by fire.
pray for each other. Go ahead. I want to pray for you. Come on. Accept the word this morning. Accept it right now. Make your choice. Choose him. Choose Jesus right now. Do what you got to do, Lord, but let me be a child of yours. Let me be in your will. Let me do your purpose in my life. Do it, Lord. Consume me. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable of me. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Coming to church, just coming to church, just another lady. High priest doesn't look at her as anybody important, but she is. She can't have a child, it's tearing her up. So she comes up with a radical idea. She comes to the altar and she says, I, I surrender everything to you. If you'll give me a child, I'll turn him back over to you to be raised for your work. And God answers her prayer. But she gets so caught up in the prayer. Now, I don't know how caught up she got. I don't know how. It sounds like, a, like an apostolic response at an altar call. Just saying. What she was doing was crying and weeping so loudly and so harsh that the high priest came over and tried to get her to stop. Because the high priest wasn't right with God right now. Eli was a terrible high priest. Maybe the worst. Stop that crying over that burden. Over giving it to God. I hope that never happens again. What does she do? Quit? Well, the high priest told me I should stop. I guess, I guess I'm wrong. God gives her a child. When the child is born, it's a boy. Big deal. Pentecostal, big deal. She's already made a plan. She's already got an agreement with God. And so when he's of age, she takes that boy to the temple and she turns him over to that ridiculous high priest who didn't even know what he was getting when she was out here praying. Turns him over. 
this boy, the high priest already has sons. They're terrible. Hophni and Phinehas literally get burned up by the wrath of God. That's how bad they were. Eli's going to fall off of a bench, big fat self, and break his neck. That's how he goes out. This little boy, though, is laying in the temple now, having been turned over by his mother. This miracle boy, not connected to the high priest by blood whatsoever. God speaks to him. Not Eli. He'd already passed him by. Not Hophni, not Phineas. God comes to this little guy who's all by himself, laying on the ground in his temple. And he says, Samuel. He goes running to Eli. That's the only other guy in the building. He's like, hey, did you call me? He said, no, go back to bed. Clueless as usual. Well, Samuel's laying there. And God says, Samuel. And he gets up and goes back to Eli again. What, did you call me? He said, I'm not calling you. You're not. Go back to bed. He's laying down there again. And God says, Samuel. And Samuel gets up and goes to Eli. And Eli finally has a light bulb go off somewhere in that dead brain of his. He says, oh. Hey, this might be God. Next time you go down there, if you hear the voice again, say, here am I, God. Samuel goes back and lays down again. And God comes and says, Samuel. And he says, here am I. And God says, I've called you. I've called you to bring my people up out of this mess. Samuel is the only person who fulfilled all three roles of prophet high priest judge the only one because a mother had faith to turn her child over to God and that child had faith for everything else in God's plan Lord Jesus I love you and thank you for your presence I thank you for your word and I pray this morning that everyone here has heard your voice. Everyone here has heard exactly what it is that you wanted to say to them. And every one of them, Lord, will turn their eyes towards you for an eternal view. Will rely upon you for all that they need. Use us, Lord. You made us. You have the plan. You have the purpose. Show us and lead us. And we will follow you. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Slip him up and thank him one more time.